Hello, good afternoon. Hello. We're going to go ahead and get started. I know we are um, behind schedule, but we will um, make up for as much time. I'll try to be like an airline pilot and make up for the time in the middle um, as we go along. But thanks again for joining us, the people in the room and the people online. We are super excited about this year's symposium. I'm Mary Fleming, the current president of Reed Scholars. Um, and we are um, excited about having our panelists uh, speak to this very important topic this year. Um, before we get started, I wanted to make one housekeeping announcement to the Reed Scholars in the room. If you've seen this little paper running around, um, this is our updating our membership information. So please scan that QR code and update your membership information. And that is from the membership committee. So do that when you have a chance. Um, and for those who are in the room, we will have a reception immediately following this program. So please stick around for that. Okay. So, um, For those of you who are unfamiliar, especially those on screen with Reed Scholars, we are a group of physicians and dentists who are collectively and individually working towards health equity. Uh, we have this symposium annually to highlight an important health equity topic and talk not just about the topic, but innovations and solutions to that particular topic. Um, before we introduce the panelists though for this afternoon, I'm gonna give a few minutes for uh, one of our Platinum sponsors for this year, CareQuest, which we are super excited to work with. Uh, Dr. Kaz Rafia is going to come and give us a few words of welcome before we move on to the program. Dr. Rafia. Thank you. Promise I'll keep it quick so we can stay on track. Thank you, Dr. Fleming. I echo your warm welcome to everyone joining today. My name is Kaz Rafia. I'm the Chief Health Equity Officer for CareQuest Institute for Oral Health. I'm also the Executive Vice President for Philanthropy and Health Transformation. Uh, CareQuest Institute for Oral Health is a national nonprofit that aims to build a more accessible, equitable, and integrated healthcare system for all. And we know the challenges of oral health and healthcare overall are complex. And that is why we take a multidisciplinary and systems-based approach to tackling these problems. We do our work through um, education, health transformation, philanthropy. We also do analytics, data, insight, advocacy, as well as um, education. Education. <laughs> Pursuit of health equity is the driving force for our work and it's our North Star. It is part of our DNA. From the partners and the communities we engage to grants that we make um, and to our program partners, our programmatic initiatives, all the way to the policies that we advocate for, work of health equity and equity is braided in there. It is the, through this lens that we see our initiatives. And we do so because we know that separating the mouth from the rest of the body isn't gonna get us anywhere closer to achieving that health equity. It is part of the solution. We know that the impact of oral health on systemic health has been well-documented, well-researched. Um, we know the association between the oral health disease, particularly periodontal disease on systemic diseases such as diabetes, RA, um, coronary artery disease, and also ad adverse pregnancy outcomes have been documented, researched. But despite this knowledge, here we are talking about inequities, we're talking about disparities, gaps in outcomes. And I'm sure it's no really surprise to anyone here in the room that the weight and the burden of those inequities is actually borne on the shoulders of those who are historically marginalized. We know, for example, that partial edentialism is present in 57% of Black adults compared to 46% of all other Americans. We also know that primary tooth decay is present in 28% of non-Hispanic Blacks versus non-Hispanic white population, which shows up with only 18%. We know CMS has put forth a very powerful framework for achieving health equity. But we also know that we are, if we're going to achieve and have a system where we, wherein we realize our full potential through optimal health, we require and demand collaboration and partnership. And we know that Reed Scholars recognize and embrace this. And this is why I'm actually so excited for the program today. 
I'm personally looking forward to listening to our esteemed panels and hearing about their initiatives that they're leading, as well as how they're collectively affecting meaningful change. So with that, thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for those words. Um, as, as Reed scholars, the concept of medical dental and medical oral health integration is part of what we talk to as a talk about as a common fabric, but it is uh, should be a national conversation. And we are excited about being partnered with CareQuest and the work that they're doing, uh, but also with other entities um, like the Meharry um, Health Equity Summit, which is also working on those important issues. Uh, before we move on, I do want to acknowledge our other sponsors, Ultimate, Sunlight Dental Quest, and of course the DICP office. So with that, um, I will acknowledge the other members of our executive committee who Don Lee is here with us. Nicole couldn't make it, uh, but Don was instrumental in putting the symposium together. Thank you so much. Um, it was really <laughs> He did great. He did great. Um, and we really enjoy being able to put this very important topic um, on the panel for this this year and, and help select our speakers. So with that, I am going to introduce our speakers. I'm going to ask them to come up in the order of the program. They will present from um, the podium, but we will save all of our questions to the end. So write down your questions. And for those of you who are online, you can put questions in the Q&A when we get there. Their full bios are in your programs, whichever program that you have. Um, and you can also use the QR code if you want an electronic version. And so with that, I am not going to read their full bios to you. I'm just going to introduce them by name and title. Um, and then I just encourage you to read about all the wonderful work they do in their everyday lives when they're not here with us. So first, we'll have Dr. Clara Felice, who is the Deputy Chief Medical Officer for Mass Health followed by Dr. Wando Alevula, who is Chief Health Equity Officer and Senior Vice President at Humana. Then we'll have uh, Dr. Tamiko Foster, who is Corporate Medical Director at Centene, followed by Dr. Seiji Hayashi, who is Interim Chief Medical Officer. He has the longest title ever, but <laughs> Interim Chief Medical Officer for the Community Health Plan of DC and the Lead Medical Director for Government Programs at Care First Blue Cross and Blue Shield. <laughs> And lastly, Dr. Daryl Gray, who is a Chief Health Equity Officer for Elevance Health. And I would be remiss if I didn't add that four of our uh, five panelists are Reed Scholars. So we are so excited about that. So with that, I am going to hand over the mic to Dr. Felice and we will get her slides going. Thank you. All right, so hello everyone. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm really pleased. This is a, an incredible lineup over the past couple of days, I know. So pleased to be bringing um, some practical experience from what we've learned at MassHealth to talk a little bit about health equity and payers. These arrows. Thank you. Um, so I'm gonna to start today a little bit by framing up the conversation. So this is, I represent MassHealth, um, but I'm going to share a little bit for, about the CMS Framework for Health Equity 2022 to 2032 that was released earlier this year, and which we've certainly been using as sort of a guiding framework to, to um, introduce new and continue old health equity programming at MassHealth. Um, then I'll move into talking a little bit more about Medicaid in Massachusetts specifically um, through our MassHealth program and some of the strategies that we've used to address health equity. So there are five priority areas in the CMS framework. The first around expanding the collection, reporting, and analysis of standardized data. I think everyone recognizes that action is needed now on inequities, but in order to understand and monitor and improve over time, we'll need to also have a strong foundation of data related to health equity. The second priority is about assessing causes of disparities within CMS programs, specifically within the framework. Um, and to address inequities and in policies and operations to close the gap. So how are we systemically 
um, causing inequities to occur, what can we do to address those? Priority three is around capacity of healthcare organizations, specifically including the workforce to reduce health and healthcare disparities. The fourth priority um, is related to advancing language access, health literacy, and the provision of culturally tailored services. And the fifth priority is to increase all forms of accessibility um, to healthcare services and coverage. There's some more specific information on the slides about each of those areas that I won't in the interest of time. I think we wanna really reserve time for the panelists to kind of talk about their experiences, um, but you can certainly access this online and go through it. And I think as we talk through some of the strategies that we've all employed, you'll um, recognize where some of the specifics come into play. So at MassHealth, um, we, like many others, have um, an aim to achieve measurable reductions in health and healthcare inequities experienced by MassHealth members. And specifically within this five-year period, our strategy is focused on race, ethnicity, language, disability, sexual orientation, gender identity, and other social risk factors, specifically what we'll commonly refer to as health-related social needs, social determinants of health, social risk factors, all our terms that, that relate here. And we have three primary strategies um, that we would like to apply, both in the way we operate as a health plan and also in how we pay and incentivize our providers to provide care and a fourth strategy that brings them together. So the first is really around strengthening social risk factor data collection. You can see the synergy with the CMS framework here and strengthening systems to both to use those data to actually um, inform and um, promote uh, activity and interventions related to health equity. The second is in implementing evidence-based strategies. Even while we wait for the data to be perfect, continuing to act and implement strategies related to uh, promoting equitable access and quality and in particular, I've highlighted here a few areas that are priority areas for mass health, given our patient population and the needs associated with our patient population, including maternal and infant health, justice involved populations, health related social needs and disability and language access. The third is to, to really build that foundation, build the fabric around equity that we think is essential to success, both for us as a health plan, as well as for our provider organizations in order to make equity a part of the everyday fabric of action. Um, and that includes cultural adaptations, leadership, strong leadership, investment, resourcing, structures and workforces for equity, um, and, and as well as an amplifying member and community voices and partnerships, which we really think is essential to success. Um, our fourth strategy is really around how do we as a health plan use our unique health plan levers to promote this across the healthcare system in Massachusetts. We cover about 2 million members in Massachusetts. Um, now it's up to 2.2 or 2.3 million members um, after the pandemic, which is about a quarter of our population. We cover 40% of kids, 40% of all births in the state. And we really think that we um, have an opportunity to use our position in terms of service to our membership to drive uh, change across the, the system. So I'll touch a little bit about how we're approaching the first three strategies at Mass Health specifically. And then the fourth is really focusing on how do we translate that um, into, our, into our provider and health systems. Um, so collecting standardized and comprehensive data around RELG SOGI. Um, we went into this exercise about a year and a half ago to really revamp the way we collect data. We were sorely out of date in terms of how we approach this, how our members may have experienced it. Um, and we, like the rest of the country, I think, recognize that there are opportunities to improve upon data collection, especially around standards um, related to sexual orientation and gender identity, where we hadn't collected it before from our members. Um, we wanted to use a member-centric approach as our first and primary priority, um, promote interoperability, recognizing that we are one of many systems that our, our, our members and our patients will interact with, and align to the extent possible with statewide and national standards. And we actually came together with the other payers in Massachusetts to align around a voluntary set of standards so that we reduce patient burden and responding, provider burden, um, as well as our ability to eventually interoperably um, share information across systems that expand beyond Massachusetts. Um, we, are, we began several years ago collecting standardized and comprehensive health related social, social needs data for our members around housing, food instability, um, utility needs, transportation, interpersonal violence. And we are able to, fortunately, through some of our waiver um, or, or kind of uh, innovation permissions from the federal government, to actually address many of the needs that arise through supportive um, housing interventions, um, supportive food interventions and other things. So we are both um, promoting screening, which we think is an essential first step and doing everything we can to make sure that there's a bridge to a service and that that needs actually gets identified and addressed. 
Um, we also are using social risk factor data to begin to stratify performance over time. And this will be a continued important uh, step in using the data to actually inform uh, action and, and make change. Um, I won't go through all of these, but just as an example, we're doing a number of things that we know. Um, we don't have full data yet, but we know that there are interventions that we can undertake already to begin to address inequities. For example, around maternal infant health in Massachusetts, we're in the process of adding doula services and foot mass health benefit for the first time underneath our state plan to provide support for our pregnant, birthing, and postpartum members. We've expanded our postpartum eligibility to 12 months because we know that much of maternal morbidity and mortality doesn't just occur in the first six weeks after our pregnancy. Um, we also, for our justice-involved populations, for example, are providing 12-month continuous eligibility once they leave a carceral um, institution. Um, and we're seeking to actually be able to provide more supports prior to transition as well, to prepare people to, su to succeed in, in uh, maintaining their health once they leave a, an institutional setting. Um, with regard to health-related social needs, as I've mentioned, we're screening, we're trying to provide the services that we can, we're providing tailored care coordination services in particular to our membership that is experiencing housing instability or um, homelessness. Um, and particularly when it's comorbid with mental health conditions or other conditions that make it even more challenging to, to find a home. And then finally, um, with regard to disability and language access, really thinking about the way we encourage our members and support their journey throughout uh, Mass Health membership to maintain eligibility for our members who have disability. Um, uh, I'll talk a little bit more in a second about our accountability framework for ACOs and hospitals. And then also supporting some of our specific and targeted um, care coordination models, in particular for members who receive long-term services and supports. Um, I think from a cultural, structural, and workforce standpoint, we also see this as um, a journey for us and one that we have worked on for some time but need to continue to strengthen. Um, around culture, I think you know we we believe that at Mass Health and through our health systems, we really need to recognize and prioritize the elimination of disparities and equity as a first and foremost priority. Um, and having participated in a lot of training and education so far, really thinking through how we can support um, implementation of class standards for culturally appropriate linguistic services and otherwise, um, seeking relevant accreditation really thinking through how our leadership is represented in the state and the new governor has actually brought in a lot of um, what we see as very positive ideas about sort of equity leadership, both at the gubernatorial level, as well as at the EOHHS level, as well as at the Mass Health level. Um, from a structural standpoint, we are building out a lot of the ways we engage with our members right now. We unfortunately don't engage with our members to the degree we would like to. We wanna hear what they have to say. They should be telling us what they wanna see in our programming. So we're building more opportunities to do that. Um, we also have worked through strategic planning and otherwise um, are, are doing a number of things to improve um, the diversity of our workforce and encourage our workforce to reflect the members that we serve more than it does today. Um, and thinking through a lot of the coverage policy, um, what do we cover? How do we cover it? Are we introducing systematic bias in the way we think about um, coverage determinations that we can improve upon and or eliminate? And then finally, collaboration and partnership with other sectors. Um, we work within, we're one of 13 agencies in our Executive Office of Health and Human Services, and so work very closely with our Department of Children and Families, our Department of Public Health. Um, we work with our housing uh, office as well, and, and trying to think about how we as a health system can improve upon those cross-sectoral um, relationships that we know are going to be essential to addressing whole person health. So how do we transition this and take it beyond just mass health and ask our providers to participate in this and well? as well. Um, so in the past five years, we, uh, under what we call our 1115 waiver, our innovation waiver from CMS, um, we shifted our delivery system. So we transitioned about 80% of our members into accountable care organizations for the first time, which really represented a sea change in the way we thought about accountability and value for our membership, um, focusing on health, health outcomes and quality, lower costs, and improved member experience. So in this next five-year waiver, we're taking that one step further and really setting up to make equity an equal pillar of value alongside quality in a way that we just haven't done before and that we see as the future. Um, so we will, we are introducing, we are four months in to introducing parallel incentive programs for our ACOs and MCOs and our hospitals um, to make equity really at the forefront of how we think about paying for value. Um, and what that does, Practically speaking, we have clinical quality programs like we always have for our ACOs and MCOs and hospitals, where we're incentivizing aggregate high quality care or um, 
priority domains that you see represented here that are really important to our membership. Um, we've got a fair amount of money associated with each of those things for hospitals, $250 million, and for ACOs, about 0.75% of their total cost of care. And then alongside that are introducing a health equity incentive program, which has three major domains in the next five-year period. The first relates to uh, enhanced data collection related to demographic data, as well as health-related social needs data, including not only identification of needs, for example, in HRSN, but also referrals and tracking and monitoring to get people to what they need. The second domain really relates to informing um, and introducing interventions to reduce disparities in quality and access with a specific focus in access related to our members with disability and language, um, preferred language other than English. And then the third domain is really around establishing strong organizational capacity. So thinking about things like cultural competence, what is our members experience of cultural competence with their providers? What can they tell us about how well their providers are doing? Um, as well as the opportunity for our health systems to earn uh, external accreditations and or um, standard uh, health equity standards, essentially to improve the way their organization functions with regard to equity. And similarly, so the, the money tied to this is um, for 60 acute hospitals across Massachusetts, $350 million related to equity, and again, 0.75% of the total cost of care for our ACOs. So I think we're reserving questions for the end, so you can ignore the slide, but thank you for the opportunity to share and looking forward to, to the discussion. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> um, I know we just had lunch, so I'm going to have to help us push through this next section. Um, my name is Dr. Wando Olaiwala. I'm so honored to be here. Um, in a couple of years, will be my 20th anniversary of completing this phenomenal program, and it has paid dividends beyond anything I could have ever imagined in my life and my career. So I do just want to acknowledge and thank Dr. Joan Reed and, and, and Yang and everybody that's been part of uh, my own personal and professional growth. Um, so it's great to be back here. I, I have the privilege of serving as uh, Humana's um, first Chief Health Equity Officer and Senior Vice President, which is a role that I assumed just about two years ago um, for Humana Inc., which um, is headquartered in Louisville, Kentucky, and just um, a few blocks away from where Breonna Taylor was killed. And around that time, the, every, lots of organizations were thinking about, well, what, what is our role in, in all the things that are going on in our, in our nation? And one of the, the out, kind of the outputs of that was Humana decided to create this, this office that I, um, that I have the pleasure and the blessing of leading. So I'm gonna just um, talk with you a little bit about our work and how we are, sorry, my slides are not see, how we are kind of addressing health equity and aligning with that CMS framework. Is there something else I'm supposed to do? Sorry, I don't wanna. Missing out. Well, it's not me. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Okay. All right. So I don't really have any. I'll tell you where I work. That's my my main disclosure. But I do think it's important for me to share this with you because this is very important part of my life, and I love that um, Kevin did that earlier and shared a little bit about his family. My husband, Paul, my two children, Darius and um, Nisi, um, I got engaged actually during my fellowship here and married right after. And so these kids were not in existence when I was um, there, but they have taught me so much about, about life and learning a lot of the work I do is because of I have uh, the opportunity to be their mother and to be Paul's wife. So um, so just a little bit about the, the organization I work for. I know many of you might know of Humana and you certainly know Humana probably as, as a large um, payer. And so we are a large payer. We are um, largely in the Medicare Advantage space, but we do have a significant military um, um, service uh, insurance um, plan. And we also have a growing Medicaid footprint. We're now in seven states for, for Medicaid. And that's what you see on the on the kind of the insurance side of the, this wheel that you see. But on the left side, it's probably the thing you know less about, which is that um, 
We also have, um, we are the largest um, provider of senior focused primary care in the nation. And so we have about 249, um, this says 235, but 249 uh, clinics that we own that deliver primary care and senior for, for seniors across the nation. So a lot of our work is, is definitely focused on our, our senior population, um, a large home health and large pharmacy um, service delivery model on our care delivery side. And this is all under the name CenterWell. So you might not necessarily know that that's also Humana. Um, and then we also do a lot of work in health in the health equity space and millions and millions of, of screenings. Um, that was like our my previous colleague mentioned every year. Um, part of what, what is important to understand about the that having that population of membership, um, particularly on our membership side, but also on our primary care side, is that we all know that the demographics of our nation are changing. People are living longer. And as we see more and more seniors living longer, we see that they're also um, the seniors of, of racial and ethnic minority backgrounds are increasingly growing. They're living longer. They're, they're expressing more concerns about chronic diseases that they have. And one of the Commonwealth Fund um, reports that came out a few months ago shared that one out of every four racial and ethnic minority seniors feels that they've been discriminated against in our healthcare system. So some of what Dr. Joe Bedencourt was talking about earlier about what happens when they come to, to get care from us is that we don't necessarily treat them well. So this is a really important perspective that we have around um, the work that we do and some of the, the things that um, make health equity really important for our organization. So I've been asked to talk about that second priority. So I won't, I won't go through, you already heard kind of the, the framework of the priorities, but really around um, policies, operations that people are using to close gaps in disparities. Um, CMS, I'm not gonna spend time on this, but CMS has made a lot of progress already in that priority by reframing some of the way they finance um, care, a lot of the um, uh, innovation models um, that some of our fellow alumni are, are, alumna are part of. Um, working on, and also uh, the new uh, CMS final rule that just came out a few weeks ago that is now um, asking all health plans to provide, um, to meet this health equity index, which is a relatively new um, index that we're going to all be held accountable for. So there's a lot of activity that is already happening at the CMS level that is influencing the work of the plans, and particularly those that are that, that deal with um, Medicare and Medicaid. So our health equity work looks very similar to my colleague that just present, presented from Mass Health, and also the journey that CMS is taking um, starting off with collecting the data, using those insights to make decisions and inform our actions and policy, and then if, kind of trying to figure out what capabilities do we have and what do we need to be able to be effective. We started off, we've done a, we've done a lot of work around collecting data, understanding our members' health-related social needs, understanding demographic um, attributes of our members that influence their health, influence their health care. Um, but then a few a uh, few months ago, last year, we actually published a paper in New England Journal of Medicine that was around um, how we can actually look at disparities at the health plan level and how you look at different subpopulations in a way that you could you could create scorecards for health plans to be able to um, drive improvement in their work. And I'll share a bit more about that later. But one of the first things that happened when I got to Humana in April 2021, I said, hey, give me all the data on the things that we know about our members disaggregated by race and ethnicity. So I just have an idea of what my job is. <laughs> and it was interesting. We didn't have it. We didn't have it. I mean, we have, and I remember being, I remember being a primary care uh, you know, clinician for so many years and be like, gosh, I wish I could just, the health plans have all the data. They have all the knowledge. I know everything. I've got everything. And I wish I could just have that. And so I get in, I'm like, oh, we, we have a lot, but we have not looked at it in this way. And so the, my first um, activity, um, Two months later was a was a was a data disaggregation sprint where we took all of our um, clinical financial outcome utilization data and we disaggregated it by race ethnicity and started to see like what what kind of things do we do we have to deal with and what we found um, and this is this slide largely speaks about Black uh, Medicare Advantage members but if we did the same ex exact look for our Native American Indigenous members our Hispanic Latinx members. Um, we would see things that are very similar. So every, for every racial and ethnic minority group that we have, we saw them underperform in every single thing that we looked at. And that's that's kind of the takeaway of this. I don't want to go into each and every one of these things, but you know, some of the, the things that drive costs, that drive poor experience, um, that drive you know barriers to care, we we see that our members really struggling with that. And so this was like this being able to present this to our management team in July of 2021 was illuminating because they were like, we didn't even know we we had all these things. We hired you, but we didn't even know we had all these things. So this is now this now became <laughs> what we use to drive a lot of our work and our data be, our strategy became completely informed by this. So how we're kind of lining up with that this priority, I'll, I'll go through a few things. Um, one was to create a, a health equity strategic plan. Um, and so that was, you know, again, a, an early order of business of mine after kind of seeing what the data was telling us. We ended up after lots of different iterations of our work, um, focusing on three things. And there are lots of things that are important to this work. They're not necessarily all levers that we can pull as a health plan. And so um, we've we've decided to focus it on, on three major areas, improving access to care, 
improving the quality of care and addressing barriers to healthy living. And under each one of those, there's a whole portfolio of work that we lead or that we partner with folks to do to be able to, um, to achieve th these goals. Um, another thing that's really important is that I mentioned that other side of that wheel I showed you, the primary, the large, huge primary care delivery footprint that we have now, now requires to think about where do we go, where do we offer primary care, and how do we do it in such a way that recognizes the, the changing demographics of our nation. And so for our center well side of the organization, we have a very, very, and this is literally center well has boomed from like 40 or so clinics when I got there in 2021 to almost 250 now. And so we're, it's it's rapid, it's, it's one of the fastest growing parts of our, of our company. And so we are very thoughtful in where those clinics are located. I think to the point that was made earlier that um, we deliberately go into health professional shortage areas. We go to places where we don't see lots of folks taking care of our communities of color. And so we're in like, you know, if you're from Houston, we're in the emancipation area in Houston. We're in lots of the third ward. We're in lots of places where there are not a lot of, there's not a lot of healthcare access. And so we're very deliberate about where we go and making sure that we're actually working with communities as we are coming to build these clinics in these places and making sure that they're, they're fully engaged in the process. Um, another thing that we're doing is looking around how do we innovate around what we can do to close gaps. Again, recognizing that we're a plan, um, but we're also a provider of care. And so I want to just share a, a, a quick snapshot of some of our disparities related innovation work. I have a whole team on my team, um, on the health equity and social impact team that I lead that, um, that does our, our innovation work. And so if you take a person that has, um, you know, a senior that has multiple chronic diseases, has financial strain, has multiple health related social needs, and we try to figure out, well, why do they have these gaps in care? They haven't had mammograms, they haven't had colonoscopies, they haven't had, colon, you know, colon cancer screening, et cetera. We're testing a lot of different solutions to be able to see um, what what of these things can actually help reduce these gaps and get them get them plugged in. And so we're looking at things like community health workers, but also virtual personal assistants and other sorts of things. So we're just testing and learning a lot around um, what sorts of interventions that we can we can create that can help support our members and our patients in their journey. The, um, the second last thing I'm going to share is about our health, our health related social needs strategy. So we've been doing a lot of work for a lot for for many years recognizing that many of our, our members and our patients um, struggle with at least one um, health-related social need. And that could be strain, financial strain, food insecurity, housing insecurity. So trying to figure out how do we kind of operationalize taking those insights, but also creating programs. And so we we have done, use our leverage our benefit design as a really important instrument to be able to um, address some of the social needs. So this this last year, we, we announced that all of our members would have, um, in, in many of our plans would have um, access to uh, what we call a healthy options benefit, which allows them to use their Humana benefit. They have a certain kind of allowance every year that allows them to use towards, um, used to be, it started off as a healthy food card and they could they could access healthy food across the nation in, in like 5,000 grocers. But then um, we expanded it now to utilities because we recognize people still need help with utilities, they need help with housing and rent. And so it's, it's really expanded and grown. And then the final thing I'll share is that all this is great. Don't you guys think my work is great? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm just, I'm just checking to make sure where you're still here. All this is great, but it's it doesn't matter if you don't have a structure for accountability and making sure that this this work can live. It, it needs to outlive me and whoever else is going to be this role after me. So one really important thing, two two important things I'll leave you with is the first one is that we have created um, and are getting ready to to launch a a scorecard for our entire um, leadership team and management team at Humana that is going to be Humana's first ever health equity composite. Um, we're going to build on some of the things that we that I shared that we we um, published in the New England Journal um, last year, but also hold our every single person in our organization accountable for making sure that we are reducing gaps and reducing the disparities between our different populations. And so this is a really important um, mechanism for us to create accountability to make sure we're transparent about where we're performing and we're gonna be looking at all of our different management team leaders and how are things happening under your specific area. They'll get a report card and all that. Um, and it will also help us to really focus in on, on the right work. And then the final thing that we did, and this is really, really, really exciting news. We, uh, we are getting ready to launch, uh, actually May 24th, um, We'll be launching Humana's first Health Equity Advisory Council, and um, actually, the coordinator of that council, Faith Obano, is here in the back. She came to this conference. We raise your hand so they can see you. Yeah, so Faith is here. Has worked really hard. But what you see here is a cross section of leaders at Humana. We have the presidents of both our insurance side and our care delivery side that are on this council, and everybody enthusiastically said yes because they felt like it's important for them to be held accountable. But we have finance. We have marketing, we have pharmacy, we have clinical strategy. So lots of different, we, we thought very long and hard about who would be on this and what we needed, but making sure that at every level of the organization and 
that everybody feels like health equity is their responsibility. And it's not just the job of the health equity and social impact team to do this, but also very much the responsibility of all these folks here. So with that, I'm gonna stop and thank you all. And I'll, I'll um, take some questions at the end. So, got it. Good afternoon, everyone. I have to say, I am just thrilled to be here. I can't believe that just seven years ago, I was here as a fellow giving my presentation on making the business case for health equity. And I can say, just listening to all the awesome presentations earlier today, that the case has been made. <laughs> like, we need to stop trying to make the case, and it's time to get down to the work. So, I'm just grateful for the invitation, and thank you so much. And we're going to move through this pretty quickly. So, um, I'm a medical director at Centene Corporation. Who we are is a managed care health plan that stands by a mission of transforming the health of the community one person at a time. We have currently over 74,000 diverse and dedicated employees doing this work. And we stand by three brand pillars, which is a focus on the individual, a focus on whole health, and also active local involvement. We have a footprint across all 50 states, uh, mainly with government sponsored programs and we represent over 27 million managed care members. So a little bit about that footprint of the 27 million, we currently have about 16 million in Medicaid members across 30 states, one and a half Medicare members across 36 states, two, two, a little over two in the marketplace across 27 states, and our prescription drug plan is across all 50 states, and that's a little over 4 million. And with that 16 million, it currently makes us the number one Medicaid managed care provider serving approximately one in 15 individuals. So this is a little bit about our racial and ethnic diversity of our Medicaid members compared to the US population and US Medicaid. Pretty diverse, but as you can see in that 21% of unknown, that speaks to some of the challenges that we talked about earlier in data collection and being able to um, get that data standardized. And this is an example of our Medicare members here. <laughs> So the work that we do is purpose driven. And if we're going to say, you know, our, our mission is stand behind our mission of transforming the health of the community one person at a time and embed that focus of the individual, it perfectly aligns with the work of health equity. So part of my job in training and advocacy is to say, hey, we're doing the work. We're saying this is our mission. And the South Side of Chicago in me says, it's enough about talking about it. We got to be about it. <laughs> so so the, it just makes sense to do this type of work. And looking at the stakeholder analysis, again, I don't know how many chess players we have in here. I think Joe used the chess analogy earlier, but when you look at the position of the payer, I mean, it really is a high power position and a high um, ability to make the change. We have the end to end visibility in the life of the individual and population health. So we really have a great opportunity to make change. So it only makes sense that we would be at the table. And it doesn't make any of these other pieces less important, of course, 
but it just means that with much um, accountability is there, we need to be able to take responsibility for that and make the change. So again, looking at the role of the payers in our diverse portfolio, this is just a little bit about the type of work that we do. Anything from benefit design to advocacy to population health and innovation. So we help to create the rules around eligibility and enrollment, also in policy and philanthropy and those partnerships with the community and our vendors and our providers. We also have a lot of opportunity around population health, the ability to really press for these evidence-based guidelines to give whole person care and to address social needs and risk of our members. In addition to that, data is huge. And we had wonderful talks and discussions about the importance of data and as it relates to the work that we do, innovation and technology and alternative care and payment and delivery systems. And again, across all of the things that we do, being careful and mindful about applying that health equity lens across it. So considering the CMS framework, again, we won't go into all of this, but embedding in some of the foundational essentials that we're trying to wrap our heads around, again, coming back to the customer as our primary focus, and how do we build that into the CMS framework, the community and the culture. And as you notice, the bottom of all of that, kind of the foundation of all of this work is the data. And that can be both a great opportunity, but it's also one of the, the rate limiting steps in actually getting the work done, how good your data is, the quality of the data, because based on the data is how we're going to be able to find those disparities that inform the work that we do. So this slide is a little busy, but um, I put it up here to just kind of give an idea of how um, some of the plans, some of the feedback that we get is, hey, this is great. We know what we're told we need to do around advancing health equity, but how do we actually do it? That's the question. So this slide isn't going to answer that. I'm sorry, but it can tell you an example of how it should look across you know, your operations. Again, some of our fellows said it earlier, health equity and equality and things of that nature. It shouldn't be this separate thing that only takes part in one department. It really needs to be a part of the structure, the strategic plan, and part of everything that you do. And so this slide just gives an example of some of the operations that we have. I didn't name the specific programs, but from a social perspective, we have, pro we have programs around housing, food, violence pre prevention, health literacy, obviously the clinical programs and operations. From a network perspective, do we have the right network? Do we have the right providers in the network? Does the network reflect the demographics of the people that we serve. And so those are the questions that we need to ask. And especially when we're contracting, it needs to be built into all of those systems. It needs to be built into the operations of your marketing and communications, into quality, into compliance. It needs to be built into IT and technology and policy, of course. So again, it's not this separate project, but it's really built into all the work that you do. And part of the opportunity and what we're trying to elevate at Centene is to really stand up this work in all the departments. So here's a few examples of some of the data that we're collecting. This is Centene Medicaid member social needs. Now, as some of you know, Dr. Alice Chen, who's a former fellow, joined our team. And she wanted me to make sure that I pointed out that the percentages are so low because we're just not starting to collect some of this data. And that's the, you know, <laughs> and that's the case for a lot of places, right? We have some plans that are way ahead of the game and some that are just starting. And part of this and what some of the work that we're doing is really trying to build that framework uh, from a central and um, corporation-wide effort and standardize it. See, so these are some drivers of health for food insecurity, housing insecurity, and transportation insecurity, just to give you a snapshot. And again, looking at those social determinants to determine how we can intervene. And this is the same for our Medicare members. So we have some work to do, and we know that, but we're starting it. So this is a case example of housing in Arizona. The focus here was SDOH and housing instability. Uh, what was done here was a direct integration with the statewide homeless management information system. I believe this was the first in that state, um, maybe the nation with this particular type of integration is my understanding. The intervention was that we implemented a centralized referral process which prioritized MCO state funded housing according to medical risk and necessity. So the outcome with this was pretty good. This was only done over a 12 month period. So what we saw in that was a decrease in 20% of our unhoused members. 
And from a cost savings perspective, emergency transportation went down, inpatient admissions went down, behavioral health claims went down, pharmacy utilization actually increased because people were actually getting their medications filled and refilled. And we had a total utilization savings of about a half million dollars over just a 12 month period. So this is just one program over a one year period. And this didn't really account for some of the other things such as they had, we had increased in their just clinic visits. So people were showing up to their appointments. Um, we had wraparound services with employment, um, health and counseling and things of that nature. So the key learning here was what we know, housing is healthcare, right? And again, just documenting these improved health, health outcomes helps us to better be able to make the case for further intervention. This one I won't go into as much um, because of time, but it's just another example of using the data to identify disparities. And in this case, pulling in the quality measure of HEDIS um, to inform how we're gonna reduce the disparity. And also looking through it through a cultural sensitivity lens and how that plays a role in addressing healthcare disparities. So using this health plan data, it was noted that there was a disparity in postpartum visits in a particular um, community. And they went out, they did interviews, they actually talked to the members. I mean, how <laughs> they talked to the members to find out why this was happening, right? And we had community councils to figure out. And what was discovered is there was just a particular um, kind of postpartum practice that was specific to this community and their time frame and ability to seek postpartum care. So based on that, there was education for clinicians about the, the quarantine practice in this community. And there were alerts placed in the electronic medical record um, and just differences in how they actually scheduled the postpartum visit. So it wasn't looked at as, oh, they're not being compliant and this and that. But it was like, no, you don't understand the culture. And we need to have those conversations. So the outcome for this was HEDA scores for postpartums increased from 50 to 82% in this pilot population. And the key learnings from this is, again, using the data. But I think more important than that was having the conversation with the people who are you making decisions about. And they need to be at the table to help you understand how to make the solutions of what works best for them and not what you think is going to work best. And then, of course, working with clinicians to develop culturally targeted processes and practices. So this is a snapshot of some of our health equity and partner land disparity projects, several in planning, several in implementation, anywhere from chronic care improvement plans to colorectal cancer screening. And we actually have some groups that are part of the disparities leadership program. And these are some of the projects that they're working on. We have a group that's working on delivering healthcare in rural areas, one that's addressing maternal health inequities, one that's addressing uh, increasing antidepressant medication adherence, and another one that's engaging micro farms to improve food security. So when talking about the challenges, um, we'll probably get more to this in our Q&A. Of course, there are many, but with every challenge, there's an opportunity. And probably some of the biggest, and, and, and just shout out to the fellows who talked about data, some of the challenges. I mean, these talks have been so aligned today, but you, it needs to start with good quality data and having the alignment of the data, being able to understand it and involving the community in that process and members in how to collect the data best. Of course, challenges around trust, you know, building relationships and healing relationships. That's huge. Uh, we talked about um, just some being in the areas of where a lot of things are happening. I currently work out of Minnesota or Minneapolis. So a lot of this change was happening and all of a sudden things were pressed on fast forward to say, hey, we know this has already been happening, but what are we going to do about it? And now we have an audience that where people are actually listening and investing in making change. There's challenges around leadership and strategic alignment, financial challenges, of course. So some of the feedback we get is, again, hey, this is great, but how do we have a sustainable financial model to do this work? We don't always have the budget to hire um, certain uh, a chief medical officer or certain things to do this work. But again, we have to be creative in our ability to do this work. And again, 1115 demonstration projects is the way that we can build in a financial model for integrating social determinants of health, as an example challenges in contracts, challenges in threat of policy changes. I think the end of the pandemic protection was one recent example of that when a lot of Medicaid members were disenrolled. So how do we get involved with that to say, we need continuous eligibility for certain populations. We need to be able to stop the Medicaid churn and stop people from losing their coverage. 
and of course in health outcomes and communicating values. There's a bunch of opportunities too. And we won't go into all of this. Again, big on the list is technology. But with every technology we do, we need to be careful about potential biases and increasing disparities in that work as we build that out. Opportunities in health and improving the health of the member. And that's really what this work is about. We want people to be better. We want them to feel better. We, there's opportunities in DNI and training and quality. Again, policy and of course to reduce avoidable medical costs. And I'll end with one of these, uh, a big opportunity, especially for our health plan. And that's NCQA health, accredit health equity accreditation. Now with this, you get a stand up model plans. It usually takes anywhere from nine to 12 months to get accredited. And they help you to build that strategic framework around the kind of the basic model of health equity. To date, we have 14 accredited markets. For us, each market is counted once, but we have several products under each market. And again, it's a contract differentiator. It's no longer a nice thing or kind of a, a wish to be involved in this work, but a lot of the regulators are actually requiring it. And that's a good thing. I stand for that. And we need to stand for that. And it also helps with staff alignment and overall improvement of care. So I just want to thank you. And I know a lot of times our colleagues tease us about going over to the dark side, but I say, hey, we are the light and darkness. <laughs> we are exactly the right people in the right time to be in this space. So thank you. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> So I'm Seiji Hayashi, and um, I'm going to talk to you about my experience um, uh, at Care First Blue Cross Blue Shield. And um, Mary was saying that my title is the longest. It's because I have two jobs, and I was, <laughs> but I was also joking with Wando that um, you know, the longer your title is, usually the lower you are in the organization. <laughs> Like in the federal government, you know, you're part of the Department of Health and Human Services, the Health Resources and Services Administration, the division of this and that and blah, 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 right? And then you have president, right? So, like, <laughs> yes, thanks. All right. Okay. All right. So I'm new to managed care. I knew nothing about health insurance. I was thinking that I would never go to the dark side, you know, right? Insurance, pharmaceuticals, no, I wasn't going to go. So I was at this payer conference um, on health uh, disparities and um, on especially around the social determinants of health. I was around all these CMOs of the large health insurance companies, and I said, you guys suck. You need to pay for social determinants of health initiatives, right? <laughs> and then I was talking on the side after that um, with the CMO for Care First, and he was like, we're trying to do that. Why don't you come join us? And I was like, uh, 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 uh. <laughs> so, okay. So here I am at Care First. <laughs> there we go. So Care First is a Blue Cross Blue Shield um, organization. And I don't know, I knew nothing about Blue Cross um, Blue Shield. Did you know that there are 32 of us? Did you know that we cover all 50 states? Did you know that collectively we serve 100 million people? I was like, no, I didn't. And I'm, I'm learning every single day. But we are a regional um, plan around uh, Maryland, the DC uh, metropolitan area. And we serve about three and a half million people. We have been around for a long time. Our largest sort of client would be the federal government. So if any of you worked in the federal government, um, Care First was probably your um, insurer. And um, But we do have a Medicaid and Medicare um, plan that I am personally sort of the medical director for, also our dual eligible special needs populations. And that's um, basically our work. I joined, I, I got, you know, the CMO for Care First, when he invited me to, you know, consider a position, I started looking into Care First. It is a not-for-profit organization. I was like, oh, that okay. They're not too far in, in the dark side, but you know. And then I saw the mission, right, of really providing access to affordable, quality, and equitable healthcare. And I saw that. I was like, okay, well, do you really mean it? <laughs> right? I asked, and and he said, yes, we really do. We're really trying to do this. 
and we need somebody with on the ground experience. And I, I'm going to talk about capacity building. We heard from you know Clara about the framework. We heard from Tamiko and Wando about like all the great things that they were doing. But what really happens on the ground? How do we actually do that? The capacity building, right? So I'll talk a little bit more about that. All right. So I did say that uh, we do have a Medicaid and Medicare plan uh, in DC and in Maryland. Um, and it's part of what I'm going to talk about is also, and I'm, it's true with Centene and Humana and others, where we acquire plans, right? And when we acquire plans, it's actually different organizations coming together. And how does that actually work? And there's a lot of you know, uh, nuances to that that I'll talk about. But in terms of capacity building, there's so many things that I can talk about in terms of like, you know, what works, what doesn't, how do you actually make things happen? But I do, I want to highlight, you know, three, three areas, social determinants. And as um, our friend Alice Chen wrote with um, Chantana Agarwal, you know, the, the drivers of health is probably a better way of saying, you know, the social determinants of health. But there are lots of drivers of health that we're trying to do, you know, and we saw from Wando and um, Tamiko, um, the different activities there, but we do wanna uh, look at, can we pay for transportation? In DC, we can, in Maryland, we can. And can we provide housing? We can't do that in either jurisdictions for Medicaid, right? Uh, what about food? Yes, we can hire people, you know, um, partner with um, organizations to provide food security. And so there's lots of different ways in which payers can do this, but we have to be creative. Um, policy development. When we think about policy uh, development at the plan level, I'm thinking about three things. Number one, is this a covered benefit, right? That's number one. Does Medicaid allow us to pay for this? Number two is, is there a medical necessity for this you know, service, right? And that's always sort of, now, that's where I come in and my team of nurses and doctors come in to say, yes, this is medically necessary. And the third piece is cost, right? So let's bring sort of this whole thing together, right? So number one, um, sort of an example, I was um, given a case to review um, and it went through appeals after it was a third level appeal. I usually don't get involved with any clinical decision making at the ground level, but when it's you know, like second or third level appeal, I get involved. And this was for, you know, a 15, a 13 year old uh, trans girl who wanted to have a GNRH uh, analog, right? To, uh, as a puberty block, right? Now I thought, great, you know, um, it's appropriate. Uh, it's treating gender dysphoria, it's medically necessary. And I confirmed this with an expert, two experts, outside experts to confirm that this is the right thing to do. And so I was about to say yes, but I thought, hmm, let me just check with compliance. Now, compliance said you can actually provide supplemental hormones, right, for uh, gender affirming care. But it doesn't say anything about puberty blocking, blocking hormones, right? And we went to uh, the Maryland um, Medicaid and said, asked that question, and they said, nope, you can't do it. And we're like, why not? These, we're getting hormones to stop a hormone. Right. And they said, nope, we can't do that. And, and thinking about and really researching what's going on, there's a lot of politics involved. Right. But um, and why we were not allowed to do it. But what I'm bringing back here is, this, you know, um, all of you, you know, who are in this space about disparities and equity. You know, if I didn't ask that question, you know, who would have asked that question? And now we're I'm trying to think about, all right, how do we cover it? How do we work with Medicaid to authorize it? How do we make sure that our staff actually understand the issues so that when things like this come on, we can be compliant, but at the same time, we're you know, making sure that equitable care is delivered, right? The cost piece is a really tough one. For me as a medical director, I don't know, Tamiko, if you deal with this at all, but sometimes we do have to think about costs, right? Um, all of us are paying premium for our insurance. We don't want to pay more. Nobody wants to pay more. Medicaid doesn't want to pay more. We personally, in our um, insurance um, plans, we don't want to pay more. So it, it is a real thing. But when you know new technology, new um, treatments come out, you know, what do you do if something is necessary? Have you guys heard of the new um, genetic um, uh, treatment for hemophilia, hemogenics? 
Yeah, there's a new gene therapy for it. One time dose, you can cure hemophilia in 90% of the people. How much do you think this one dose costs? 100,000? <laughs> All right. 10 times that. $3.4 million for one dose, right? Yeah. So for a small plan like ours, right? I mean, for Centene and Humana, Element, maybe. <laughs> we, if we had one patient like that, we would be in big financial trouble, right? So Medicaid and Medicare hasn't ruled on whether this will be um, a covered benefit or not. So it's now going back to the benefit side, right? Medical necessity needs, right? If you're hemo, if you're a hemophiliac, right, then you can um, you should be able to get a treatment like this. But how do you pay for it? And so these are some of the things that we have to do. But again, going back to capacity building, we have to have people like us in this room making sure that you know the people who need the care are getting it. And, I, and you heard about the data infrastructure. I'll talk a little bit more about that. But, you know, when I think about building the capacity within our organization, I'm always thinking about the systems and the tools, the people who are doing it, and then the workflow, right? And so, um, you know, I'm going to give you an example about data. And, um, you know, you saw a lot of great data um, from Wando and from Eco. But I was looking at primary care utilization, right? We have supposedly we have all the data, right? The claims data is going to tell us all of it, right? I'm asking care first people, hey, where's the disparities in equity data? And they were like, uh, we have it somewhere. Oh, we pulled it like last year, you know, right? <laughs> we should be able to get it again, right? And so this is kind of um, uh, issue that, you know, I think most um, health plans have. And so I was looking at the data on primary care utilization the lowest utilization in primary care it was in Baltimore County, right? And also in this rural um, county called Cecil County in the northern part of Maryland. And we're like, so why Baltimore and then this rural county and Cecil County? And when I looked into the data and the demographics, Cecil County is more um, white than, you know, Baltimore County is a predominantly African-American black, right? but the utilization is almost the same. I'm like, what the heck is going on here? But for us to sort of even build the capacity for people like us to kind of think about why this is happening and, and you know, what to do about it, we need people like you joining our ranks to say, all right, how do we get, you know, um, you know how, do we, how do we, number one, ask the questions, make sure that um, we're looking at it the right way and then do something about it. And the short of it is that Cecil County has a lot of um, uh, substance use disorder. There's also very few primary care um, practices in this rural area. And Baltimore, it's just overwhelming need, right? And so there's a lot of different um, uh, reasons for it. I'm running out of time, so I'm just gonna go really quickly. One of the things that um, we're trying to do at Care First is also where there isn't capacity is to like build it. And so we do have a, um, an investment arm for care for um, we purchase or create new companies to do what we uh, need to do. So um, one example would be CloseNet. Um, this is a telehealth company that um, we help start. Uh, we are asking um, uh, CloseNet to actually start seeing our members and Medicaid who have not used any services. And perhaps we can get them engaged first, right? Uh, another example would be live chair. This is the idea of you know, community engagement at the barbershops. So um, it started in Baltimore, um, and now we are using that um, organization as an outreach and engagement to make sure that um, they get engaged. And it, it's actually been amazing. Um, our initial sort of primary care engagement, you know, calling, uh, engaging people, getting an appointment, and then making the appointment, we need people. Um, our initial rates were like 5% completion rate. With live chair, we, um, in the first three month pilot, we've, we've been able to get up to about 
And, and then as they get to know the community, it will get better and better and better. And so there's a lot of things, you know, lots of great ideas, but it's really about people like us asking the right question, you know, making sure that, um, you know, we have the right sort of resources and the right places and thinking about it in the right way. And then the network, right? Um, Alice from Centene called me um, a few weeks ago and said, hey, can I pick your brain? Now we'll do the same thing that I'll call Wanda and we'll text each other, right? And now that I know that Daryl's over there, I'm gonna be, uh, <laughs> right? And so, you know, all this is to say that in order to make something happen, it takes us, you know, those of us in this room working together. And, um, and so every year when I come back, not every year I come back, but when I do come back here, the energy that I get, the, um, the camaraderie, the, it, it's just like, it's incredible, right? Joan created something so incredible that it's just going to be, you know, just feeding me, feeding all of us to do the work that we need to do. But we need more of you to join the um, payer side so we can actually make a difference. All right, thank you. All right, good afternoon, y'all. I hope, I know I am the closer here. Um, I, I I ask that you buckle in because I'm going to fly. Uh, I want to, um, uh, both figuratively and literally. Um, so I want you to uh, uh, hold your questions. I'm, I promise I'm going to get through this quicker than the time that I've allotted so that we can get to some Q&A so then I can fly home because I want to stay married, y'all. I have a wife who is who is absolutely extraordinary. And uh, she's watching our four little ones age from age one to age eight. And so she's got her hands full, but I wanna get back. While we're getting the slides up, I'll just say, this is a full circle moment for me. Um, uh, one in part, because I learned about the fellowship from Joe Betancourt. He came to Washington University in St. Louis, where I was doing my gastroenterology fellowship, talked about, at the end of his talk, talked about the fellowship. And then I said, Joe, I wanna do that, help me do it. He connected me to Ying and Jackie, who connected me to Dorado, who's somewhere in this room there, who told me also about the fellowship. Graduated through the fellowship, got connected through other people, have stayed connected to Wando, who is like my sister. We're texting every day. Wando connected me to uh, Shantanu Agarwal, who is my boss at uh, Elevance Health. And that's how I got into the role that I'm in now. Um, and I've had the, uh, the, the opportunity to kind of shepherd, if you will, a couple of the fellows who were in this room, including Kevin and, and Ajwa, who graduated. Uh, so really, this is a full circle moment. I'm, I'm extremely excited. It's also um, a special moment. If I get this slide up real quick and I hit the, okay, uh, next. There we go. It's also a special one. So this is a, the graduation picture from May um, 30th, 2014. My dad is pictured here. And this is quite special because um, uh, my dad is an internal medicine physician, long retired. Um, practicing inner city Baltimore. It's because of him that I became interested in medicine. And I saw the impact that he had on people in times of sickness, certainly, but also in times of wellness. It was also a, a special time because his father did not get to see this type of moment for him. As a matter of fact, um, his dad um, passed, my grandfather, who I never met, passed when he was in high school. He was just weeks away from graduating high school and his father had, my grandfather, had a hemorrhagic stroke that he subsequently died from. And so as we think about, um, and I think about him, who Jeff, our photographer here, who's taking a picture, he'll appreciate. Uh, my grandfather, who I never met, was one of the first African-American photographers for the Social Security Administration, pre previous Navy, Navy servicemen, but he did not utilize care that he had potential access to. Um, and he wasn't engaged in a way that was meaningful for him. And so he dealt with chronic hypertension that ultimately led to a stroke in his, his demise. And, and so unfortunately, this ultimately becomes legacies in our families. And all of you in here have the opportunity to break that legacy. That doesn't have to be strongholds uh, or generational curses, if you will, over our family. But certainly what we see now and what we see today, and I put faces on there intentionally, including two of my kids um, um, uh, up there, because um, we oftentimes look at trends like this. We saw graphs yesterday and we, we've seen them today, but unfortunately, sometimes we lose track of those are people, those are faces. And in this case, these are my kids. And these don't have to be our generational uh, curses. 
Certainly, when I came into Elevance Health, and for a moment, let me tell you that Elevance Health is a large health plan. You may not recognize that name. We were formerly known as Anthem. Um, so one of the largest health plans in, in the country. We have 48.1 million members. We have 100,000 associates um, uh, across the nation and even beyond that in the Philippines, in India, um, uh, in Ireland, et, et cetera. Um, uh, but when I came and I joined in August uh, 2021, again, thank you, Wando. Um, uh, but at, one of the first things I was introduced to the organization, uh, I, I said, look, I, it's truly an honor to be here, kind of did all the pleasantries. But I said, if, if we are going to advance health equity, it is not just going to be because I am in this role. It's not just up to me. We will not be successful that way. I'm good, but I'm not that good. Um, and so we have to, it has to be everybody's business in our organization. It has to be in the infrastructure, in the system that we built. And Pearl here, um, I'll just say fellows, particularly as you go out into the workforce, do amazing things, build systems that will outlast you. Certainly we've seen the example of Joan Reed and what she's done with this fellowship, what she's done beyond that. Build systems that outlast you. And that's my goal. So one of the things when I built, um, created the strategy with, with, with my amazing team around health equity, it was health equity by design because we wanted to say intentionally that health equity is not a separate vertical, it's not a program, it's not a service, it must be embedded in all that we do. And you've heard even here in the classrooms here that every system is perfectly designed to get the results that it gets. And so we are designing for that outcome that we want. And intentionally in working with our chief strategy officer, our CEO, our board, um, we made sure that health equity is the bedrock of all that we do as an organization. You see it uh, represented here, that it really is the foundation of all that we do for our four strategic pillars as an organization. And um, our, our key strategy, this health equity by design framework is focused on really five things in, in the near term. And what the beauty of this for this session is that it, it nicely overlaps with the CMS framework as well, which um, we, you know, this strategy came out, we did this in 2022, and you saw the CMS framework, which is nicely aligned here, which is wonderful. I, I'll say that it really does dovetail on what all my colleagues and friends have said, has said earlier. And I'm just going to put in simple layman's terms. First, it's important that we build relationships with members through how we collect and leverage their data. Do so in a way that is builds trust and allows us to not only meet the needs of those whom we serve, but anticipates those needs and ensuring that we have a um, uh, optimal consumer uh, our health journey for our members. The other is we certainly need to be better partners with our providers. Having been a provider, having people who hate on us like Don, uh, who helped to organize this, uh, is that, you know, we're viewed as, uh, we can be viewed as a dark side. We recognize that there's opportunity for us to be better partners with our providers. But frankly, there's also um, a better opportunity for us to help enhance the capacity of providers to deliver on our mission, vision, values in advancing health equity. Part of that is through incentives. Part of that is through training um, as well. Additionally, we are keenly focused on identifying and scaling evidence-based practices to improve health outcomes. So we start with things like demonstration projects or pilots that we hopefully can scale to such a large membership that I mentioned. I should note that as far as our membership we have a really, as my, our CFO would say, a very balanced portfolio of, 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 of plans. We are in the Medicaid space. We're in 25 states. Uh, we have commercial plans. We have Medicare plans. We have federal business as well. And so we try to scale. And I'll tell you a little bit about some of the work we're doing there. The other thing is that I'm extremely passionate about, again, this goes to one of the first statements I made that health equity is everyone's business. We are keenly focused on advancing our culture of health equity, ensuring that we get our own house in order because we represent we represent uh, many members across the nation. We are a microcosm of America. And so we wanna make sure that we are in our Ohio State where it's one band, one sound in advancing towards health equity. And lastly, I'll say we are always um, trying to push the envelope in improving access and affordability. Tamiko, I think it was you that mentioned NCQA health equity accreditation. I think that is critically important, but I will also say very frankly, I think that NCQA accreditation is important. It is great to have. It applies rigor to ensure that you are taking systematic efforts to ensure that you are, uh, again, applying rigor to the work and the strategies and the implementation, implementation of work that you're doing as a plan or as a health system to advance health equity. But it is not innovative. I, I think it is a foundation for being innovative and certainly we are leveraging it in that fashion. We were the first uh, health plan in the nation, uh, thanks to many team members that I get to work with, 
uh, to have full three-year NCQA health equity accreditation across 22 Medicaid plans. That's 93% of our Medicaid membership. And we are still cruising. We're getting, we are part of a pilot, one of nine uh, organizations across the nation for health equity plus accreditation. We are pushing that envelope and that's good, but we aren't resting on our laurels there because we recognize there's a lot more work to do. And that work has to be reflected in all that we do from supplier diversity to what we're doing around climate. And yes, we do quite a bit around climate. We'd love to talk about that in the Q&A. Um, for a medical policy, how do we shift? And there was a presentation earlier that talked about language and policy. How do we shift the language and policy that impacts what's covered, what's not, and um, how do we um, decrease disadvantage for those whom we get to serve? You know, we have an office of responsible artificial intelligence. Happy to talk about that in the Q&A as well. But how do we both anticipate bias? How do we mitigate bias when we identify it as well in algorithms that impact patients and our providers? And certainly talked about earlier was benefit design as well. You know, we have to continually challenge ourselves to innovate. Part of the way we do that is through research. I love that even though I'm outside of academic medicine now, I still get to be involved in research. And it's asking critical questions that allow us to advance the field. Part of that is, thanks, um, part of that is how do we ensure, and we talked about this a lot today, collect race and ethnicity data that is done in, in a trusted way. Look, there's a myth. Many employers feel that they cannot share this data with health plans. And so we worked and partnered with a few organizations to put out data in partnership with a legal entity in regards to, yes, you as an employer can share this. Here's why, and this is why it's important. Uh, but we also, as you know, the face of research today does not look like the face of America. We want to be a part of that solution of diversifying the face of research because we know that innovation comes from research. And so we partner with organizations like the NIH and the All of Us Research Program. And we're continuing. We're one of the, as far as our blues plans, we're one of the lead recruiters for the All of Us uh, Research Program. But um, um, as one of our, um, uh, Wando and I's uh, late professor, Frank Hale, used to say, uh, commitment without cash, and, and, and Kim is smiling because she's called me out on this before, but commitment without cash is counterfeit. And so we are putting our dollars where our mouth is. And I'm showing you some figures from our foundation because we are putting mil tens of millions of dollars, not just in the, in the hands of people, but people in the community, community-based organizations. And it's really across four different areas of focus. So maternal health, food as medicine, substance use disorder, and disaster relief. And all of those dollars are going towards advancing health equity in those areas. And as I talk about them, I'm just gonna show you a few outcomes that, that reflect, and I won't go through each of these bullet points, but know that this money is going to communities of color. You see the percentage up there. Know that this money is going towards outcomes in regards to preterm birth, C-section rates. Uh, and we're seeing actually tangible impacts of that. Knowing this, Know that this is influencing uptake of doulas as well. So we're making progress in advancing maternal health equity, understanding that the trends are not moving in our favor as it, return, as it pertains to our black moms. But also, as has been mentioned previously, we are working to diversify the, pop, uh, the pipeline of, of, of health workers. Here highlighted here is a young man um, who is an Ohio State, uh, soon to be Ohio State graduate. Yes, go Buckeyes, OH. Um, and he oh. came. <laughs> and there's, there's always that one Michigan fan in the crowd. Um, <laughs> and, and so we, he would, came to us as an intern. We have an internship program, and he's an aspiring physician scientist, but also now is an aspiring Elevance Health employee. Um, so we are kind of enriching the pipeline, we hope, but also giving. We talked about, somebody talked about debt for scholarships, uh, debt for students earlier. So we have Health Equity Scholars Program. We're helping to fund in HBCUs and Hispanic serving institutions. But also to go back to the point I made, commitment without cash is counterfeit. And um, I think to Tamiko, you mentioned this and several others mentioned this. I think, um, uh, Wando, you mentioned this, accountability. Um, we actually tie our pocketbooks. My, my, my payment is tied to us performing on maternal health uh, metrics. This was something we worked to embed into our compensation plan that we have to demonstrate improvement in severe maternal morbidity and preterm birth as a part of our compensation. That's the commitment that we're coming that we are tying to this. But look, y'all, this work is personal. This is part of my team. This is amazing team that we have here, um, but this work is personal. It's, it's, it has to be. Uh, this is uh, who we get to serve. This is everyone's business and we lead from that lens. And I'll stop there so we can get into the questions. I can get a flight.
Are your brains and hearts full with all of that exciting and wonderful information? We're doing great until the global thing. <laughs> Yes, please. Okay, we're going to do a couple of things. One, if you have a question, um, there's a microphone in the back. If you have a burning question for Daryl, I would say try to go first because he does have to scoot out. We also have another very important guest who also has to scoot out. So I'm gonna bring her up um, so we can present our vision award to Dr. Mitchell Jordan. So if you wanna start making your way um, and then <laughs> um, I, I just want to take a moment to um, say how honored I am to present this award today. There are people when you're in their presence that automatically awe and inspire you. Dr. John Reed is one of those people for me and Dr. Mincha Jordan is another. Um, she has been a constant supporter since we first, I first met her, but a lot of you have known her longer than I have, um, to the Reed Scholars Program, uh, to me as an individual, her commitment across her journey, not just to health equity, but to the communities that she serves is echoed over and over through the work that she does. Her bio is extensive, like, along with our other guests today. So I, I um, ask you to read that. But in her position at CareQuest, um, she was just, it was so affirming and so unwavering her um, immediate support of the Reed Scholars and the work that we do. So thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, and I would like to present you with the Vision Award. If you will come and I'll pass you this so I can get the award out. Okay. Oh, it's sure going to be like uh, lifting weights on the on the way home. So I'm just going to um, read. So it says the Reed Scholars presents the Vision Award to Maisha Minton Jordan, MD, MBA, President and CEO of CareQuest Institute for Oral Health. In grateful appreciation for your continuous commitment, dedication, and support of our organization. Thank you. So Thank you. So I'm going to be super brief because I feel like we have someone trying to catch a flight. We have a panel here um, to, to whom I'm sure you want to ask many, many questions. Um, I just want to say um, I'm going to ask a very do a very quick poll. How many of you have someone in your life that if they call on you, you answer and you do whatever they ask you to do? All right, so that's Joan Reed for me. Uh, so Joan called me many years ago and we were just reflecting. Um, I've been in Boston now about 16 years and she called me at the beginning of my career when I was chief medical officer at the Demick Center um, and told me about the amazing program that she was starting. And for many years, I've come in as a guest lecturer and it's just always been an opportunity for me to see the brilliance of the people that are in the program. And so when I moved into the role at CareQuest Institute, it was very natural and immediate for me to say, how can we continue to do the support for the program, but also to expand that support? So I'm very excited about the people that I've worked with over the years, the people I've had the opportunity to connect with, um, but also just thrilled to know Joan, to see how her love for this work, how her passion for this work has manifested itself in everything that, that you've experienced today. And many of you have experienced for much longer than that. So I'm grateful for the award. It really is a testament to um, the partnership and the collaboration between people who believe in health equity and people who understand that this is our moment to lead, our moment to make change and to transform the way that the health, the, transform the healthcare system in the way that it needs to be transformed. So I applaud all of you and thank you for the honor. Thank you so much. And I would be remiss if, again if I didn't acknowledge that CareQuest um, has supported our oral health sponsorship um, for our Joseph L. Henry sponsorship that we give every year for the past two, three years, I think. Um, and our this year's recipient, of course, was Zarita Buchanan. So congratulations and thank you for that. Okay, so we will move to questions. Do you all have a, is there a burning question at the mic? There's one here. Oh, 
Okay. We can. Okay. So, we started this with a welcome from CareQuest. We ended this with someone from CareQuest getting a big reward. My name is Bruce Stonewall, uh, and I've been involved in this for a long time. Longer than <laughs> Probably longer than anyone else. My passion right now is medical dental integration. Joe Henry was the interim dean of this school. And then I followed him as dean for 28 years. I'm an oral surgeon. I'm a dentist and a physician. And I'd like to ask the panel, will we ever advance oral health equity and access without putting oral health into primary care itself? Who's going to tackle that? <laughs> so first, thanks. Thanks for the question. Um, and thanks for the work that you've done. Uh, I would say I, I think there's great opportunity there. Uh, but but I'll go back to um, something that I recently learned. So it, I, I haven't had much in the way of oral health experience aside from personal experience that of my kids and wife um, and then certainly the colleagues within in the fellowship. But I'll give you an example. So uh, a month ago or so, I sent a note out to the network, to our kind of listserv, to ask, hey, um, any of our oral health professionals and those of expertise, can you send me um, examples of trainings on oral health inequities that you, and many of you may have seen that in the listserv, um, uh, trainings that are available from either societies, through membership, you, you've done personally. And I'll tell you, there is even within oral health societies, dental associations, there is a lack of training around oral health inequities. And, and you, you may be familiar, I, I don't know, maybe you can educate me on a little bit of, of what's available. So, so I think that there's opportunity even within the oral health societies, but certainly within medicine, to your point, and certainly uh, Brian Swan, you've talked about this quite a bit previously, that, that as we think about medical health, we should certainly in sync think about oral health. There's such great opportunity there. We don't, well, I shouldn't say we in general, when I was in medical school, let's put it that way, um, that was not necessarily taught as an opportunity of synergy and care delivery. I think that just as we think about how we integrate other parts of the care continuum, behavioral health being an example, I think we should also be thinking about oral health. But and so I do see as, that as possibility. Thank you so much for that question. I do, I do want to just, um, in my previous life, um, I had the opportunity to serve as a chief medical officer of a large network of community health centers. And for those of you who in the room has been part of or works related to community health centers, because I will say, well, thank you. <laughs> I will say that the community health centers have uh, has been a place that actually has led in the integration of primary care, um, oral health care, and behavioral health care. And many community health centers, including the one that I used to lead, um, did a lot of work on site, all of those services in the same place. Um, and we would refer, I mean, I mean, Sagey knows really well, we, this is something that the FQHCs have really, really led in. So I would say if we can do what the federally qualified health centers have done in the way they have, they have made behavioral, dental, and, um, and primary medical care, all accessible within the co-located co-located within the same space, but also with workflows and processes that allow for them to to refer and and collaborate with each other. Um, I think that I think if the rest of the healthcare delivery system can follow the lead of the community health centers, then we have a lot of opportunity. Yeah. Okay. Can I get a, you got a black eye question in there? Black eyes. I would just invite anybody. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Real quick just wanted to thank you for that call out, Dean. And I just wanted to invite anybody, if you need any resources, <laughs> hit up OH. The Buckeyes always find a way. <laughs> so I, let me, I have a question from online real quick. Well, two, I have one shout out. So there, there, there are um, scholars on Zoom watching us. So hi to all the scholars on Zoom. But Kim Rose wanted to shout out the first Joseph L. Henry Oral Fellow, Shante Richardson, who is in your class, Savannah. Um, so that's a shout out. But our question from Alexi is, 
Uh, so thank you for your work. Um, but do any of you see a pathway to increase the number of Black, Latino, and Native Americans being in plans that reimburse at least at cost levels? For instance, pediatric beds continue to be closed as hospitals continue to lose money on these beds, given the 40 cents on a dollar reimbursement they face from public payers. Another tough one. I mean, I can just comment briefly. So we're obviously Medicaid, so we do not pay at the same level as everybody else. But I think there's been a movement across the country amongst uh, Medicaid plans to continuously increase reimbursement. And CMS has actually, for the first time, required us to ensure that reimbursement, in particular for um, behavioral health services, primary care services, peripartum services, is approaching at least the 100% value for Medicare. Um, we, we couldn't agree more. We would like to pay more. <laughs> Um, and, and I think until we do, of course, our providers are going to be have less resources to address the things we need. So it's a great question. We're largely Medicare Advantage, so I'm going to let No, I, I would just agree with what you're saying. And I think um, it actually becomes a challenge because a lot of providers don't want to maybe contract because of the lower reimbursement rate. So it, it becomes like this cycle. And that's exactly the type of people that we need in order to do the work. So we have to be able to raise the payment rates. And it's for some of you, I don't know how much most people know about how health plans work, but Medicaid, for instance, that's, we get guidance from CMS, but each state has the ability to determine, you know, what the eligibility and reimbursement is going to be. And even from a managed care perspective, for each managed care plan, they can also set um, certain criteria and rules around how they're going to re reimburse things. So just to kind of level set on how that works. So it can be very simple, but also very complicated because what you decide on is, is not necessarily going to be across the board, but it's going to be very state dependent, very um, organizational dependent. And that's a big part of how it's determined. So I'll just add that. Donna, did you have a question on that? Yeah. Thank you, all of you. You guys are so wonderful transparent, amazing, just uh, just a bowl of fresh air, just, just amazing. And one of the things I wanted to ask about, you guys are sitting in spaces of innovation because the majority of you are in spaces where they didn't exist, they created it, and now they're there, and now you're doing something amazing with the space you're in. Um, as an innovator in the health tech space, one of the slides, several slides, talked about capacity building and connecting with payers and innovation. I'm wondering from the outside looking in, how do you get into the room to deliver your innovation? And who are you looking at? Who are you pitching that to? Um, if you can give insight to that. And my second question is, how do you feel prepared now than when you said yes to the job? <laughs> I'll, I'll take the innovation piece. Um, so I, I think most health, large health plans have an innovation investment arm, right? And, um, and so we all sort of look at companies or technologies or whatnot that would help us do our job better, right? And, um, and especially around health equity, um, you know, a lot, most of the, our innovation work and investment arm are looking at what are the things that nobody else is doing that we think that, you know, we could do ourselves um, and, you know, have a return on investment. And that return on investment piece is probably one of the most important things because as a health plan, I, as a medical director, I'm, I'm always thinking about, again, is it a covered benefit? Is it medically necessary, right? But that cost piece is what the company leadership will always be looking at. Is it going to decrease cost at the same time maintain the quality and equity piece, right? For me, it's like, is it improving quality and equity? And then are we not, you know, going in the hole? <laughs> that would be, you know, the way I would look at it. But if you're going to be pitching an idea or, you know, a company or a technology or something, you have to be speaking to what's going to reduce costs first. But making sure that, you know, if you can make that argument for the equity and quality, um, you'll have a better um, chance at that. But unfortunately, I think the pitch is going to have to start with the cost. I, for, I forgot. Can you say the second, second part again? How prepared are you now than when you said yes to the job? Oh, um, 
you know, I, I think, and I can't speak for, for all of my panelists, but, you know, certainly coming into the industry from being in academic medicine, there's a steep learning curve. And, and I think we're always continuously learning at, that goes back to a point that I think one of the first points that um, Joe had on his slide, be a lifelong learner. Um, and I think that that continues to prepare us to be better and better each day, be better every day. That's, that's what we work towards uh, and to create systems that, um, um, that will outlast us. And I, I think preparation also comes with being collegial. Um, so, you know, I connect with Wando, like I said, pretty much daily. And I think it's our exchange that continues to help prepare us each day for new challenges that come. I think, I'll, and lastly, I'll wrap up by pulling out a quote from a Morehouse brother. I know there might be a Morehouse brother or two in the room, um, but Sean King, um, during a black male summit in Akron in 2019, he was keynote, I was a, a small working session. Um, and in his keynote, he said, do the thing that makes you come alive to impact the issue that breaks your heart. Do the thing that makes you come alive to impact the issue that breaks your heart. That passion behind that, doing that thing that makes you come alive will be a stimulus for you to continue to just prepare and prepare each day as if each day is different because in the work that we do, each day is different. Um, so, yeah. Oh. Um, so are we still recording or is this off the record? Yeah. No, no, just, the views and opinions expressed. No, <laughs> it's all good. But I was just going to say, uh, yeah, absolutely. Each day is a journey. And I just kind of think back when I first transitioned over and I was I think it was a moment where it was like, man, I'm probably going to not last. Year. I mean, they're going to fire me because I believe that everybody <laughs> deserves access to certain things. And certain things just didn't make sense. You know what I mean? Like people that need a rise to dialysis. I'm just being transparent. If they, you know, benefit exhausted and we only pay for so many rides a year, but it's like, man, you deny that. But if they don't go to dialysis, then they're going to end up being readmitted to the hospital. You know, so it's those kind of decisions. And if you're somebody that's really passionate about equity and, and, and advancing the work, I think each day for me is kind of one of those things like, yes, I need to be fiscally responsible because there is a time of place. You know, we want the right time, right place, right care. But that cost is a reality as well. And so I think part of that journey is just learning how to be mindful and um, really wise about that and discerning about making those decisions. And some of them are strictly, you know, policy and criteria. But part of that is being able to come in. If we're going to advance this work of health equity is to say, hey, we may need to rethink about how we make coverage decisions about this. And we actually just because I spoke up about some, you know, how go you speak up, you're going to be the person in charge. But <laughs> one of the things because <laughs> we were seeing like some racial bias in some of our clinical policies, racialized medicine, just different things, not, not intentional because a lot of the guidance was coming down from national programs saying this is how you approve certain services. And I was thinking about you and your, um, the fellow was talking about the organ transplantation and things like that. So a lot of times we're getting the guidance from national vetted organizations on how we create our policies. And out of that came like, hey, we need to relook at how this is done. So now we have a committee that's set up to actually look at our clinical policies to make sure that we're taking out bias, being careful about our biases in those determinations of who gets to get procedures and surgeries and cares and you know, supplies and across the board. So it's a day-to-day -day process. And I think the equity journey is very new in the space of a managed care plan. I mean, honestly, I've had people working in the healthcare industry that's been there for 30 plus years and said, what is health equity? Like they just didn't even know how to define it. So you have that set and then you have others who are further advanced. So it's definitely a learning journey, not only for them, but also for us and just really handling it with grace. Like I just really try to show up to work every day and just extend grace as much as possible. So. Um, I, I definitely, then I want to take your, go back to your first question. Cause I think you asked something that's really important. I, I actually agree with everything that's been said. So lifelong learning, I learn every day. I know the places where my gaps are and I'm, I'm working really hard to supplement them in different ways. So I won't speak to that, but I, I think your first question about, um, you know, having had my career be on the in the tech space where I was on the tech side of healthcare, trying to get the health plans to hear what we had to offer and in doing that. And then also now being on this side. 
Um, my perspective is that a lot of times, um, I think to, to Seiji's point, a lot of times when you're coming to an organization like any of ours and you've got something that you think is a, is a, is a valid product or, or tool or resource that we should be thinking about, um, people do lead with a lot of that. We've reduced the cost of care. We have a you know four ROI. You know we have four to one ROI. Those kind of things. I will say that having been on both sides, um, it's everyone says that <laughs> to us. So we have. If you think about your one organization, think about thousands that are reaching out to all of our organizations every day, and we're making decisions constantly. Are we going to build? Are we going to buy? Are we going to buddy? You know, partners. Are we going to? You know, wh which ones are we going to do? So the more you can know about, and this is for anybody else that's kind of in a, on the innovator side of healthcare, the more you can know about the company that you're trying to work with, um, that you're pitching to, and you can appeal to whatever some of their really important drivers are. Like, you know, someone just reached out to me the other day and said, oh, I see that Humana is, is, is ranked number 10 for diversity, equity, inclusion by Diversity Inc. We have this product that helps you source your, you know, things better. I think it would be, it's, it helps a lot more if your conversation starts with something that we care about or that we, we are publicly saying that we do rather than just, I've got this thing that will reduce your total cost of care by this, because we, we hear that all day. So think about that as you're kind of putting your pitches together um, and coming to the, to the point. And I'll just add one more thing, speaking from the Medicaid perspective, the investment overall in innovation in Medicaid from the private sector is dwarfed by the investment in Medicare. And that's because of the perception and reality that that's where the money is. So I would encourage you to not forget to talk to your local Medicaid. I know in many cases that will be mass health and me. And so I invite you to come in. But for those of you who are in other states as well, um, please talk to, uh, to your Medicaid um, agencies in your state, because we know that that's one other area of inequity. Our members don't have access to the same innovations as members in commercial plans do. And that's largely because it's not seen as a place for, for fruitful investment um, in many cases. And that's uh, just another source of inequity that we experience. So thank you for the question. I've got two questions. First is really brief and it's for Daryl and Wando. Do you know why it's so windy in Ann Arbor? <laughs> oh my because God. Ohio State sucks. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, too bad Laquandra left, you know, but uh, no, I, I have a policy challenge or a question for you guys, right? I mean, I heard, I think all of you talk about lack of data this morning. We heard about lack of data. And part of that's because a lot of patient registration systems are set up for billing. So they don't ask race, race ethnicity. They don't ask educational level. They don't ask about all those other social, economic, environmental conditions that produce health. However, you guys pay them. So why don't you guys work with Medicaid and Medicare to require that they collect that information. Once you collect that information, you can hotspot, you know, where are the challenges like by education level, zip code, you know, all that stuff. You guys have the levers. Why, why aren't you doing that? Thanks, Anthony, for that question. Uh, I, I, would, I would say that we are. Um, so, so first, Certainly, whether it's um, how we partner with providers to get data that they collect at the bedside, or if it's kind of outreach and engaging with our members directly. So, so we work to do both. And, and we have, and actually Medicaid is a great example because we have most of the self-attested data on things like race, ethnicity, language um, in Medicaid as compared, and I speak from a plan that has you know, commercial exchange, uh, Medicare as well. And as we look at how it's stratified, you know, imputed data, meaning I impute based on, you know, some technology I use like, you know, um, eTech or RAND, for example, that will impute based on your last name or based on where you live. Um, we actually have the most self-attested data in Medicaid. And in part, that's because we do exactly what you're, you're suggesting. Um, the other way that we do that is we are leveraging technology, um, digital platforms. So we have a digital platform called Sydney Health. It's where, you know, um, the members can actually go online, see, you know, if, if it's to pay a bill, if it's to see when their next visit is, if it's to um, engage in virtual care, they can go to this app and do that. But it's also a mechanism through which they can update their profile and give us data directly as well. Certainly, we leverage touch points, whether it's through case management or our consumer experience team to also ask directly. So I would say we're doing it, um, but that we need to keep doing it and do it even better, particularly as we think about opportunities, as was highlighted earlier, around sexual orientation, gender identity data. We certainly, uh, we've created a policy. Uh, I, I was fortunate to lead a team that did this 
create a policy on how we would collect SOGI data, use it, and how it's governed and maintained private as we interact with, with members, but also how our teams interact with members as well, how they ask the questions uh, and so on. So I, I would say we're making progress, Anthony. I just wanna add that. Oh, and with that, I'm sorry, I'm gonna jump, I'm gonna give John Reed a hug and then I'm out. <laughs> So regarding data, um, obviously, like, you know, most of us need more data analytic capability in, internally to even do the simple work that with the data that we have. Um, in the space of Medicaid, um, especially, it's a partnership between, you know, us and the state. And so, you know, we do what Medicaid tells us to do, right? We collect the information that Medicaid asks us to collect. and um, a lot of the, and Maryland Medicaid, for example, we have this health risk assessment that all members are supposed to do once they get enrolled. And it turns out that the race and ethnicity data collection on that form is antiquated, right? It doesn't even comply with, you know, the um, HHS OMB 15 directive of, you know, race and ethnicity. And it's so old and it doesn't make any sense. And then to ask, you know, all the uh, our network providers to actually provide that data and then send it to the county health department and then to the state department, which would then report it back to us. It's, you know, it, it's, it becomes really challenging, right? So whose job is it? Who's gonna pay for it? You know, and those are some of the questions that we always talk about. But, you know, my personal opinion is that, although I think a lot of us on the health plan side was not like it, however, Advocacy organizations can go to the state, get it legislated to then be enacted in Medicaid and then down to us again, right? So there are different ways in which to do it. Um, but in Medicaid, um, at least, we actually have to follow their sort of data collection rules. And, and, and so if, you know, we can work around that end and that would be helpful as well. Yeah, I, I, agree, I agree with Daryl that and, and Sagey that we're, we're doing a lot of that. And I'm just going to speak more of the Medicare side than the Medicaid side, because as I mentioned, we're largely Medicare Advantage. But I just wanted to add one more thing to what was said is that also that we also limited in, in what we can get from um, our members at certain points of their moment. So, for example, we wanted to uh, to start to uh, collect race, ethnicity and sexual orientation and gender identity data at the point where members were selecting plans. And so that's, you know, you know, you all know that like annual enrollment period where you're doing the same thing, you're trying to figure out which plans you're going to get. That's the most captive time that we largely have our members when they're really thinking about which decisions am I going to make. And that's a great time to actually collect a lot of information. Um, and so we want to introduce that, that information, that collection, also social, you know, health related social needs, health literacy, all these things there. But what happens is that we're limited because CMS doesn't allow us to collect that information at that point because they don't want us to use that information potentially to make a decision about whether we would enroll somebody. So there are some limitations to when we can collect it. So there's some of the moments where you could really get that self-reported data, but we're not technically allowed to, to collect it there. So usually it's after people have enrolled. And we, we all know when we select our plans, once we do it, we pretty much are done. And then until we need something, we don't really come back. So that so kind of that, not having them in that captive moment um, gives us a little bit of a disadvantage in being able to get it as well. But we are working the same, same way Daryl and Sage said. And I can just add that we've been fortunate in our state to, so we, the first thing we needed to do two years ago is get our own host in order because we, the way we were collecting race ethnicity or not collecting things at all was really problematic. Just to provide one example, and I probably shouldn't say it out loud again if the, if the cameras are still on, but we were collecting language information. And if our members did not select a, a preferred language in the enrollment application, it was defaulted to English. And we couldn't tell if they had selected something or if they had actually selected English. And so we, we, we are working and are in the process of updating all the way we collect data and then allowing our plans to then ideally work off of that and collect data in a way that is, again, kind of member centric, um, appropriate, interoperable. And otherwise, and we are, you know, we also have constraints on the CMS side. So, for example, CMS requires us to tell them whether members are male or female, and there's no other option, and they have to be male or female. Um, and so, of course, as we begin to collect sexual orientation, gender identity data, as well as sex, um, how we define that, how people identify, is not always aligned with with the way we are unfortunately required to collect data. So, it's a multi-layered challenge, I think. 
I'm going to um, give another shout out and a question from the um, chat, and then we'll go, we'll take one more question from the mic. So decide amongst yourselves. Okay, so the shout out says, this is from Alexi, Mass Health, Math, I can't talk now. Mass Health has been a fabulous partner to think through creative ways to address health equity in Massachusetts. They have been the most innovative payer to address health equity among children. Huge shout out. So, so. Um, <laughs> okay, question from Kim Rhodes, which I don't think we're going to be able to answer today, but I'm going to put it out there for you anyway. Has anyone considered how to how these solutions would play out in states that have not expanded Medicaid. Are we doomed to accept continued disparities across parts of the South where we can't even name, let alone desegregate data about select otherized marginalized groups? Anybody want to speak to that? So are we doomed in the middle case space? <laughs> Y'all are the experts. I mean, we we have a footprint, like you saw our footprint in um, several states. And I would say that it's, it's not necessarily the case. Um, I forgot who it was earlier who talked about some of the work being really stood up in a state that you wouldn't think. Um, so we do have those examples. I think the, the people just have to be motivated to do it. And we do have examples of that. So taking that, even though the political piece is a big part of that, it's not the only part. And we do have um, health equity work that stood up in the states that you wouldn't otherwise think would be there. And so part of our job is to help to support that, to figure out what's working and how we can address those needs because what works in one state or one plan, you can't really apply that cookie cutter across all. So it's really good, gonna be a case by case basis and time will tell. And that's where our policy teams, like we actually do have people within the plans that our legislative and governmental sections that actually work on policy advocation for things such as that nature to help determine what type of things will help benefit the plan, such as Medicaid enrollment, um, continuous enrollment and eligibility and things like that. So this is a work in progress. So we're fortunate that we are in a um, Medicaid expansion state, but um, I just wanted to cite your CMO, Alice Chen, who wrote an article titled, I think it was titled, Medicaid as a Driver for Health Equity in JAMA, right, last year. And so, you know, Alice really lays out, you know, really well how Medicaid actually reduces health um, disparities and improves health equity. And I think that speaks for itself, right? If you don't expand Medicaid, you're not gonna address health equity in the way that you know uh, this country needs to. Um, there's some really incredible statistics about the success of Medicaid. And I think even now about close to 50% of all births are covered by Medicaid in the United States, right? Think about that, 50%. And so it's incredible. And so the power of Medicaid um, I think is really, people don't understand how important Medicaid is. And I, and I think that all of us need to advocate for um, broader coverage. Brittany, is it you? Okay, make it a good one. Yeah. Oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> well, hi guys, I'm Brittany Scott uh, from the clinic Dr. Lane Healthcare, the uh, process improvement consulting firm. And so hopefully my question's a good one. Um, <laughs> When we think about like all the work that you guys do, all that you guys put into um, considering health equity, for the patients who um, who struggle with health literacy, if we have all of these um, opportunities available, how do we actually go about communicating them effectively to them? That was a good one. I was like, if she says anything about that state up north, I'm going to just <laughs> fall out. But you did a good job. Um, th thank you for asking that question. I'm actually really glad that you did, because that's a major body of work that my team leads, which is around health literacy, both um, screening and understanding health literacy in our membership and our patients, and then also creating programs and solutions around that. And in fact, my colleague that I mentioned that was here earlier um, is, is on the team that leads that work. And so I would say a few things. One is first just recognizing that health literacy and low health literacy is is uh, is an important kind of driver of of health and um, and how people uh, kind of experience health care. And so one thing is really we, we, we screen for um, 
health literacy and we are doing a lot of programmatic development around um, how do you respond to members that help members of patients have low health literacy we're working with a, a really great um, um, organization um, with a, a, a black owned founder who many of you in this room know who does a lot of work in health literacy um, I don't think I'm allowed to technically say the name yet but um, we're working with the Ohio State University and their Center for Policy um, and Health Outcomes. Um, I, 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 that's true. I just, it just happens to come out right now um, um, on like evaluating some of our health literacy related work. And so we, we see that there are the, our members who report low health literacy are much, signif significantly much more likely to be low income, significantly much more likely to be racial and ethnic minorities, and much more likely to have mul multiple social risks. So we're using that, building that into some of our predictive models. Like before we, they have to tell us, we can say, this is probably someone that's going to have um, low health literacy. So what kind of materials at the pharmacy, what kind of um, education do we need to have with our care managers, our community health workers to be able to prepare and help those, those patients and those members. So there's a lot of opportunity and the plans have, have a lot of opportunity. We all send out um, these things. <laughs> you guys all get them, those statements of, of care and those, you know, these are the list of places you can go. And they are, for even for the, for the most, learned folks, um, whether or not you have, you know, high regular literacy, but also health literacy, they're still very, very hard to understand and to digest and people make decisions based on for their health, based on, based on what they understand. And so I think it's a great, the health plans have a really great opportunity to, to screen and to provide programming and solutions around health literacy and to partner with organizations that do the work all the time. And so that's the kind of stuff that we're trying to do. Yeah. The the organization, the department. No, but that's that's a great friend of mine. Yeah. So, <laughs> I'm to say, I'll keep it brief, but it's a great question. I think it's all part of the way we think about it in Medicaid is meeting our members where they are, like whether they want to receive care of the community from a trusted community-based organization, whether they want to see a provider in a healthcare institution. Um, I think health literacy is just a big part of that. And how do we re meet them where they are, address their needs as they identify them in a way that they receive, wish to receive them? So it's a really important question. Well, thank you so much uh, to our panel for an excellent presentation. Uh, again, of course, we all have to thank Dr. Reed for giving us the, the space to be here and, and the interaction of the room. I want to echo her sentiments earlier. I don't, uh, Ying and Jackie and Thomas and the rest of the DIP, uh, CP staff that I harass, I appreciate all of their help and, and support throughout, not just for this event, but throughout the year. Um, I, if you liked what you heard today, I invite you to stay in touch with the Reed Scholars. You can follow us online. You can watch our podcast. And I did want to put in a plug for the one that came out yesterday. So a lot of what we talk about, especially with Dr. Reed and the programs that she does, is around mentorship and building up the people who are coming behind us. So I had the opportunity to interview an eighth grader who was an entrepreneur, and she wrote a coloring book around Just for Girls. She wanted to have a coloring book that um, she could color herself into. And so I was very inspired by her. Her name is Reagan Portis. So it's just great to listen to her story and know that they're they, they're coming, they're, they're still here and, and doing great work. So I was very inspired by her. But with that, I invite you to stay for the reception, talk to our speakers as they are available. And again, I appreciate you all being here in person and online.
Thank you for listening to Reese Powers Live. Please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, or subscribe to our YouTube channel.